no heathen tribe, no, no backward nation, no South Sea Islander or Papuan ever conceived so grotesque an idea involving as it does the assumption that man was born with a hereditary stain upon him. This inherited from Adam. And for this stain for which he was not personally responsible was to be atoned for. And that the creator of all things had to sacrifice his only begotten son to neutralize this mysterious curse. He said no heathen tribe has ever conceived such a some nonsensical idea. But the man who lands on the moon, he tells you that. Same guy sitting on his backside here in America is telling the Jews in 73, he said, look the Arabs are on the move. The Arabs are on the march. They are moving. The guys didn't hit the warning. He said, we know these Arabs, man. Every time they come into battle before that, they shout. So we'll hit you. We'll do this. And we're coming. He said, no, no, no. This is not the Arab way, you know, to work silently, softly. So they were caught off guard, 73. First time in the history of Arab-Israeli conflict, caught off guard. Because they didn't, didn't heed this, their godfather here. If they'd heed it, Sadat could never have crossed the Barlev line. He could have never done it. He could never have gone into the, uh, the Sinai. You see? So I said, this guy here, can he be wrong? The answer is no. So whatever he says must be true. I said, look my brothers, please. Don't allow people to pull wool over your eyes. Think man, think. See, this is the most nonsensical idea on earth. Adam and Eve sinning and you're going to go to hell for that. And the way out is that the same God now, he knows there's no way. No way he can change these people. So he must come down to earth. Go into a woman's womb and live there for nine months. Born like any other human child. With all the filth and the muck which made his mother impure for 40 days, says the Bible. Circumcised on the eighth day. Circumcised on the eighth day. Living like any other human. Eating food. Drinking milk from his mother's breast, wetting his napkins, eating food, having a call of nature. And beaten and chased around. The almighty God of this universe, he took that role and he died for you at the age of 33. Please brothers, now what is this? What is this? Where did you get all these things from? Give us an opportunity. It's about time that the Muslims took it up. That this most nonsensical ideas on earth are getting converts. They are stealing their children in your own countries. You are here. You are God sent here. You. They are thinking that you are sent to them. It's God sent. It's making their mouths water. It's making the Christians mouth water. You see. He says these expatriates. These students. You see now we have stupendous advantages against them. Which we never had before. I have to explain this. You see what the Christians are saying. You must know. I'm reading from the Zwemer Institute, the records, what they say. They say that, you see, we have five advantages against the Muslims now, which we never had before. Number one, we can now work from a home base. We live in Tucson with our wife and children, and we can go and catch up these guys one by one. Home base. We don't have to go to foreign lands, thousands of miles away from home base. They can work in, from the comforts of their own homes. They can work. Number one. Number two, so culturally, these guys, you people, are fit to receive the message. Culturally. They, in Bangladesh, they have to sit on the floor, on the mat. Flies buzzing. And the smoke coming from the, from the kitchen, smarting the eyes. Here, yeah? nice, comfortable, your sofa, chairs. You know, your dining table and your chairs, your air-conditioned homes, everything. Culturally, you are fit to receive the message. They is a backward people. They have to go and sit down and reach down to their level. Two. Linguistically, they have to learn the language of the native. If they went to Bangladesh, they must learn Bangladeshi. They go to Pakistan, they must learn Urdu. They come to Africa, in my country, they have to learn Zulu. Wherever they go, they have to learn the language of the native. Now you have learned the, his language. Made it easy for him to talk to you. Linguistically, he's got one on you now, which he hasn't got in the in the rest of the world, third world, he's got no office. He must learn the language of the native. Previously, if they converted a man, he was a sore thumb, wherever. You see, because in a village, one has become a murtad, an apostate, and everybody says, you know, I won't use the word, well, how you feel? <laughs> a traitor, a blasphemer, you know, look at this, that guy there, you know, read that. You know, what, has, what has happened to him? He must go on mad. Right? But now, he says he can be absorbed. Absorbed in the majority. 240 million Americans. To get 201 more, easy. Two more, thousand more, all can be absorbed. 
There you can't be absorbed. You are a sore thumb in your community, wherever you are. Another advantage. Number five, he said, they, the governments are not happy that you're creating a fifth column in their midst. They're not happy. Like Pakistan, you think they're happy? That in Sialkot there are more than 100,000 Christians. In Sialkot is on the border with India. The potential fifth column of over 100,000. Are they happy? They're not happy. But they can do nothing about it. You see, they're not happy. If they're doing nothing about it, they're not happy. Here, the government is happy. Christianize them and make them one of our own. Let them eat the pig. You know, we can sell more bacon. Let them make them to drink. That we can sell more alcohol. Man, let them enjoy. Let us, let them, let us make them one like us. That they don't start coming, smarting us and telling us where we are wrong. Every time the Muslim takes up exceptions, say, look, this is not right. Your sodomites are not right. Your drunkenness is not right. Your lesbianism is not right. He says, what is all this? These guys are always interfering in our private affairs. So now look, let us make them like ourselves. Five advantages they have against us, against you. But at the same time, in reverse, you have all those advantages also against him. God has sent you here. I want to come to settle here. They won't allow me. There are millions and millions of people from the Orient and from Africa, they want to come and live here. No more. Am I right? You can't come and live here. Yes, if, unless you're a professor, millionaire, something. Brain drain, they like to keep you. Brain drain. They want to drain our brains. Get them here. But the millions who want to come here, no hope. No hope for them. But you are here. Here is Allah giving you an opportunity to go and deliver the message. To go and do the job. I don't know what excuse you are here for studies, maybe for livelihood, maybe, but this is a God said opportunity for you. You can also work from a home base, you can also speak in His language. You see, all the advantages He's claiming against you, you also have against Him. Not to that extent, but you have. I says, go to town, my brothers and sisters, go to town, go and deliver the message of Islam. And Allah is promising you, Sali you a hero who Allah deen kulli. And He's given you a deen that is the master, overcome and supersede them all, bulldoze them all. Kulli. This is the destiny of His deen. It's your privilege to go and fulfill His, his promise. Wa'ad Allah haq. And the promise of Allah is true. Yes, the next question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is not my original question. This is a question from the audience in the back, probably a female, okay? Uh, if, if we're not original sinners, why was Jesus baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist? What's the question again? If, if, if it were not original sinners, why was Jesus baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist? Uh, it looks like a Christian question. Yeah, it is, probably. <laughs> so. If it was not for the original sin, why was Jesus baptized in the Jordan River? That means Jesus had the original sin. He was not born pure. He is not fit. He is not fit to be a sacrifice, if that is the case. If that, you see now, therefore it's an advantage. The brother is a Muslim, is posing a Christian question. But the, if the Christian posed the question, then I said, look, you say, for the original sin, the person, he or she says, yes. So I said, Jesus had the original sin. That means he's a sinner. He's born also a sinner. If she says yes, then he says it's not fit for the sacrifice because the Christian says that he was the only one who was sinless. But now therefore, says the disadvantage, a Christian question being asked by a Muslim. I don't know how to really deal with it. But this is the best I can do. Yes, my brother. Mr. Didab, may I read three scriptural verses and ask you to comment on them? Yes. I'm reading from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, the 10th through 12th verse. Be it known unto you all, and to all people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which is set at naught by the builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we, we must be saved. Uh, I think it's Peter talking. It's supposed to be the words of Peter. No, these. No. Uh, who's, who's uttering these words? Those words were written by Luke. No, no, but now who's? Luke was not talking. Because Luke was not there. He was not one of the disciples. Peter was so saying these are that. the words of Peter. Yes. That's right. You see, it's the same Peter at the beginning of Acts. 
at the beginning of Acts, you see, he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, which you yourself also know. Whatever he did, he says, you, he didn't do it. It was God working through him. He was a man. He says, a man. Peter was the greatest authority as left by Jesus. You remember among the twelves, he tells Peter, he says, Peter, feed my f sheep. Peter, feed my flock. In other words, look after them. Look after them. So on this rock, Peter, thou art Kephas, and on this rock I'll build my church. On you, on the strength of what you are talking now, the way you are thinking now, I'll build my church. Peter. So the same Peter is telling you, here in the book of Acts, at the beginning, he says that he is a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did, he didn't do it. So he is the way, no way, no other. So look, the only information Peter had was this man, Jesus. And he's right. He said, look, if they want another way, he was the one who's fulfilling the laws of Moses. He's come to bring them back to the path. They had strayed away from the path. They had gone for the letter of the law. They had forgotten the spirit, the Jews. So Jesus Christ is trying to bring them back. He's trying to elevate them. They're going for the letter of the law, forgetting the spirit. And I can give you dozens of examples. Everything he said was trying to elevate the Jews. So if you want the will and plan of God, here is the man. He is the way. But now your understanding, your understanding is wrong. He is the man. Follow him. What he did, you do. But you don't do that, the Christian. The Christian world doesn't do that. You see, they are now listening to Paul. He said, the law is nailed to the cross. Who, is, who said that? Jesus? No. Jesus. So now you're living under grace. You're not bound by the law anymore. Brother Swaggart says, he said, if this, you have already purchased salvation just by believing. And if you want to add more to that, it's not accepted. It's ingratitude on your part. You say, now, look, I must fast, I must pray, I must restrain, I must restrict my life. He said, no, that is not salvation. You are showing ingratitude. The man paid the price for everything. Your rape, your murder, your incest, everything is paid the price. You just got to accept the penalty that is paid for. Where did you get it? Where did you get that? Jesus says, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. He says, verily, verily, except you are better than the Jew, no heaven for you. That's what he says, your master. He says the disciple is not greater than the master. He says, my father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. He said, the word you hear are not mine. But the father that sent me, he had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Even as the father has said unto me, so I speak. Where does he say, I am equal to the Father? He says, my Father is greater than all. My Father is greater than I. Where? No, but Paul. It is Paul. Every time you contradict me, you're contradicting the words of Jesus with Paul, Paul, Paul. Little wonder that Jesus Christ got third position in the book of Heart. Michael H. Hart, the top hundred. He said, look, it's Paul. He's the real founder of Christianity. So, brothers, I said, look, let us go to Jesus. Listen to Jesus, because if you listen to Jesus, it is Islam. That is Islam. Whatever he tells you is Islam. Only thing is that he didn't have the opportunity of explaining to you what is implied by you must not even look upon a woman to lust. You didn't know what it really means. So Islam tells you that you see it means something more than what you're reading. Not only not looking to lust, because look, I'm looking, admiring God's creation. Look at the shapely form. 36, 24, 36. What a beautiful size, proportion. I'm only admiring his creation. Are you? You're not lusting? We are. We are. Islam says, the Quran says, when you see a woman, cast down your looks. You don't develop that picture. You are developing the picture and getting into a mess. The reason? Because Jesus didn't have time to explain to you. At every step, everything that I show you, I said, look, you the good Christian, you are actually following Muhammad. Though you are giving credit to Christ, the credit comes to Muhammad. You say, don't drink. Brother Swagat says he never touched it. No beer, no alcohol of any kind all his life, he never touched it. I said, look, you are a good Muslim. You're following the teaching of Islam. If you followed your master, he turned water into wine and they had a jolly good time, as the other Christians say. He said, Jesus was no killjoy. He was no killjoy. 
So you see now, a woman, you come across a lady who has been divorced for no fault of her own. She married her glamour boy, had quarters and children. The guy was a drunkard, an alcoholic. He beat the wife. He couldn't keep a job, starving the children. So she goes before a kindly magistrate. He said, look at this. Look at my condition. What this man is doing to me. I want my freedom. And she gets her freedom, divorce. You come across that lady, unfortunate person, with the liability of three children. You know she's beautiful, still beautiful. She's intelligent. She's been through the mill. She'll make a good wife. Would you not marry her? Are you going to hold it out against her because she made a mistake? Any sensible man, he says, no, marry her. Give her protection in marriage. I say, when you do that, you're following Muhammad, not Christ. You are a hypocrite if you said you're following Christ. Because Christ said, whosoever marries her that is divorced, committed adultery. That means your children will be illegitimate. And they'll be illegitimate for, according to the Bible, tenth generation. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that the bastard shall not enter the congregation of the Lord even unto the 10th generation. Don't get shocked. This is the King James Version. They say bastard. I didn't say that. It's in the Bible. The bastard shall not enter. That means once you are a bastard, your 10 generations are bastards. That's what the Bible says. So would you like to do that? No. But if you marry that woman and you're going to beget any more children, they're all bastards. Then for 10 generations, they'll be bastards. But you say no. Now, this woman, how can I hold it out against her? She made a mistake, right? In compassion, love, fairness, justice, you give her protection in marriage. You don't want to, then it happens what's happening. New York has got one million more women than men. They can't get husbands. Your country, 7.8 million more women than men. They can't get husbands. If every man in America gets married, there'll be still 7.8 million women who can't get husbands. In New York, one third of your manpower is gay, sodomites. Your prison population, 98% of your prison population is men. Then mankind, man, gets cold feet for a hundred different reasons. You know, you've got 20 million more women on your hands for whom you have to find husbands. Do you know that? You have no answers. No answers. Salvation, what salvation are you talking about? Talk to them. There's 20 million hungry women. Talk to them. Their salvation. Those one million in, in New York, their salvation. Tell them, sublimate their passions. That's what you're doing. Are you? Sublimating your pensions. Passion. One million women can't get husbands. And the manpower that is around them, one third are gays, sodomites. We would like to entertain the written questions. Please, dear, dear brother, may Allah bless you many times. How should I act with my mother with my with my mother uh, you is a follower of Jimmy Stewart I thought she might have meant she is a follower of Jimmy Stewart Stagart. Jimmy Stagger Swagger uh, your answer is in the Holy Quran Surah Maryam you know we are talking about Surah Maryam chapter 19 in the Holy Quran I think it's about verse number 53 or so Allah tells us about the story of Abraham, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. So, was kurfil kitab Ibrahim, innahu kana siddiqan nabiya. And relate in the book, the Quran, the story of Abraham. He was a man of truth, a prophet. Is qala li abihi. And behold, he said to his father, Ya abati, O my father, lima ta'budu ma la yasmahu wa la yubsiru wa la yugni an kashayha. And on and on. You see how he, Abraham reasons with his father. Surah Maryam, chapter 19, I think it's verse 53 onwards. You read that and you read the commentary in Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translations. He is talking about a dutiful son that Ibrahim Ali Salam was to his father. How he reasons and he loves and how, you know, what, what he does to try to bring father to this light, the light of truth. He's giving us four different conditions of lines of approach and if you follow that line of approach inshallah you'll have all the success all the success the other thing is you get this Jimmy Swaggart's books on on alcohol you get it on incest incest you get it on pornography you get it on gambling and you read that and you said now look all this what he's trying to teach is Quranic he's not going far enough that's the only problem is he's not going far enough and the reason is obvious because the people he can't take them with him 
the bulk of them they don't they can't let go they can't let go of the things that they are invested in so i said now look show 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 it to her and said look everything that this brother swagat is talking about is in his condemnation of evil he is speaking as a muslim he has delivered a talk beautiful talk on hell is no joke hell is no joke i heard him and i could see the audience reaction people tearing beautiful open the quran he said now look whatever he's talking actually as if he has been copying it from the quran open up the subject hell in the index 41 different references hell hell allah is telling you hell is no joke hell is no joke is a serious matter so you'll be burnt and burnt and burnt and your skin will be renewed so it's not finished because once you are burnt the skin becomes insensitive so no new skin and burnt again and you'll come to the verge of death and you will not die you listen to swagat on his video and you see man he is as if he is copying from the quran unfortunately we have touched lost, lost touch with our book show to this mother of yours the birth of jesus in the quran show to her the index everything that the quran teaches and maybe if allah wills you know she can be inspired moved to become a muslim the question says regardless of the changes in the bible do you suggest that muslims read the bible isn't there some good to be learned from the bible as well there's good in everything you see the bible you don't read for the sake of reading no christian does that no christian knows the whole bible no christian i have come across a christian who knows his bible at the moment i say as much as i know his book i haven't come across one yet who knows his bible better than i do but generally the christians don't know they only specialize on certain verses and phrases like i am a father of one he that has seen me has seen the father no man cometh unto the father but by me and there you are the whole religion is revolving around that he doesn't know he doesn't know so reading the bible would mean that you read it with the idea that how can you approach and draw the other person towards yourself to say look brother this is very good i quote from the book of ezekiel which is exactly the teaching of islam that what you do what you sow you reap that is islam and that sin is not inherited we see there in the case of moses you read there you know moses when the people the children of israel had sin they had worship the golden calf so god says destroy them kill them wipe them out so moses goes and pleads with god he says oh my lord he said these are my people you feel for your people no man they have done wrong they are my people you want to destroy them he says look if you want to destroy them he says blot me out of thy book forget me just throw me out you don't recognize me anymore so forgive this people the request is forgive this people or blot me out of your book means forget me from that respected position of being the anointed one of god throw me out disqualify me that is the request forgive them or blot me out so god in answer to that he says i will blot him out who has sinned against me this is his law not the innocent you are an innocent man where can i blot you out for what is they who have sinned that is his law the soul that sinneth it shall die not you the quran says allah taziru waziratan wizra ukhra it says no bearer of a burden bears the burden of another what you do you carry your own sins the soul that sin it so you see it makes it your task easier because when he quotes something and you quote allah taziru waziratan wizra ukhra and you start explaining it he says no i don't accept that he says look your book says the very same thing as i was doing this tonight he says god says i forgive sin for my own sake If I said the Quran says that Allah is a loving, He says He will ghafur al wudud. He is of forgiving. He is loving. He is not Shylock, wanting his pound of flesh. But he starts contradicting you. So I will visit the sins of the fathers into the third and fourth generation. That's it. You said, look, the Bible says the soul that sinned it shall die, not the sinless. So it makes your task easier. From that point of view, you get my book. Is the Bible God's word? And I tell you now how to read, study the Bible. The Christians are not reading the Quran, studying the Quran. I'm talking about the missionaries. They are doing with a prejudiced mind. They are looking for faults, how they can exploit this against the Muslim. Now, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't also learn how we can use his book. And this is Quran. And Allah says, whenever they make a boast, any claim, tell them. 
قُلْ حَاتُوا بُرْحَانَكُمْ He said, produce your evidence, produce your proof. In kuntum sadiqeen, if you are speaking the truth, let's have a look at your proof, your certificate. That sends you to heaven and destines us to hell. Let us have a look. So he produced it, the Bible, in 2,000 different languages. Now what we are told, see, if Allah commands us to demand proof, it presupposes that when proof is produced, you'll be able to analyze it. And to be able to analyze it, I said, get my book, absolutely free, is the Bible God's word, and study the Bible according to that, so it becomes a weapon of attack and defense. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Is this the last one? This is definitely going to be the last question. So be here with me, please. The question says, Christians believe in Trinity. Would you please explain the word Trinity and how would there be one? So if you could explain it in a couple of minutes, we'll sure, appreciate it. Sure. Trinity, you see, this word Trinity is not in the Bible. Imagine, a foundation of faith, the foundation of Christianity, the Trinity, because that's what they're trying to tell us, is we say we, God is one, they say yes, God is one, but He's three in one. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, believe me, it's not there. They talk about rapture, rapture, something going to happen towards the end when Jesus comes and everybody will be lifted up, rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible. They talk about millennium, a thousand years of rule, you know, when Jesus comes, it's not in the Bible. Trinity, not there. Word Bible, Bible is not in the Bible. Believe me, the word Bible is nowhere in the Bible, any Bible. It hasn't got inside, it's on the outside. Who put it there? You put it there. How did you get this word Bible? They got it from the Greek word Biblos. Biblos means book, and they put Bible. Bible means book. Holy Bible means holy book. This word Bible is not in the Bible. Trinity, not there. You see, we have the word Trinity in the Quran. Amazing! The Christian believes, he hasn't got it, the Quran has it. The word Trinity is in the Quran. Amazing, isn't it? He believes it. In his book, it doesn't exist. We don't believe it. It's here. You know what it says? It says, Wala takulu salasa. Don't say Trinity. Trinity, the word Trinity is there. Salasa, Trinity. Don't say Trinity. Just don't believe in things like that nonsense. In tahu khairan lakum. This is, stop it, it'll be better for you. Inna mallahu ilahu wahid. For your Allah is one Allah, is not three in one, is not one in three. And at the great debate on Monday night, you see, Brother Swagat has used this word Trinity. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. That type of thing, that they are all bodies, separate bodies. Father is different, Son is different, Holy Ghost is different, but they are one in a Trinity. I was dealing with that on Monday night. If you get the tape, you'll see it. So I was telling Brother Swagat and the audience, I said, you see, the clearest verse on the Trinity is the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, Jesus, the Word and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That is the clearest statement on the Holy Trinity. But I says, you know, it's not in my book. It's not in my Bible. It's not in my Bible. So what do you mean it's not in your Bible? Maybe he thinks I printed it. Has it not printed by your same church group who printed this? The King James Version. It's in the King James Version. It is in the Roman Catholic Version. It's there. But now it's thrown out by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations. They produce the Bible called the Revised Standard Version, RSV, which goes to the most ancient manuscripts nearest to Jesus. And in those manuscripts, this verse on the Trinity was not there. This is an interpolation, a fabrication, an adulteration. And as such, Christian scholars of the highest eminence, 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they threw it out without any ceremony. 
So that's how good your Trinity is. You got the word Trinity, which is not there in any Bible. Now, that verse of self itself is now thrown out as a fabrication. Little wonder Allah says, So woe to them who write the book with their own hands. Then they say, this is from Allah. That they may reap from it some small reward, some small benefit. So woe to them for what their hands do write, and woe to them for what they earn. But still, the book is very useful. You have to have this knowledge to be able to talk with them. So I said, you have to study it. But you study it in conjunction with that little booklet of mine, absolutely free of charge. I sent 10,000 to uh, Baton Rouge for that meeting. There are some still lying there. 10,000 I sent by A. I A lifted them for the meeting. I understand 7,000 were given out. They still have them. There is brother uh, Hamid Ghazali from Lawrence, Kansas, uh, as well as the people, the MSA in, uh, in uh, Baton Rouge. You know, you can get this book from them. You see? In conjunction, study the Bible in conjunction, and inshallah, you'll be able to do a better job than whatever you're doing now. Thank you very much, Mr. Didet, for this inspiring talk. We really learned a lot. If there are some questions that have not been answered, or if there is any question that lingers in anybody's mind, Please feel free to contact or to consult the Islamic Center. And there are some brochures there on which you would find, hopefully, the telephone number and the address also. You could consult there. And I'm told that the tape will be given to our Christian brothers, that is, the non-Muslim audience. Everybody here who is a non-Muslim audience is free to consult the Islamic Center for the tape, and it will be given for free. The lecture has been taped in two cassettes, 60 minutes, and it will be given in a TDK cassette free of charge. Just consult the Islamic Center and you will get it. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the brothers, again, I repeat, we are not here to antagonize anybody. We are not here to belittle any religion, caste, or creed. If you misunderstand us for any reason, Please forgive us, because this was not my intention. Mr. Didad have not meant anything and will not mean anything, hopefully, insha'Allah. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact the Islamic Center. Again, for all, for everybody here, and especially the non-Muslim audiences, from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of the heart of every Muslim, on behalf of all the Muslims, I thank you very much for your patience, for being here, for making this lecture success. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ نَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ نَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَن